Welcome back to another report on Parallel Disney. This will be part one to our reports on The Haunted Mansion. Five mansion type attractions have been located in the various Disney dimensions. Today's video, part one, will be on the anomalies between Disneyland and Disney World. The mansions are completely different, but one thing I thought was worthy of a closer look was the weather vanes, as in Disney World it's a bat and land it has a ship. After passing the front gate at Disneyland, you'll find yourself embarking on a somewhat wind-eaten path towards the front of the mansion. Soon you get to walk by a horse-drawn hearse that is white, and there's a ghost horse attached to the reins and seems to be nibbling on a tree. If the queue is short enough, you can walk right up to the front door at this point. If it's a bit longer though, you'll end up walking past the Pet Cemetery, which has some fun tombstones to read. The collection of Dearly Departed is not limited to animals as we find a mausoleum further down the queue. What were their parents thinking? On the side of the mansion we find what looks to be a birdhouse. However, I actually believe it to be a bat box in disguise which is much more fitting. I wonder if anybody is home, and try not to squirm next time you walk by it. As we go into the front door of the mansion, we go underneath a window that sort of has a spider web look to it. Right off the bat, we can see that the brickwork and ironwork around the mansion is completely different. At Disney World, when you enter the queue, you will find yourself covered from the elements nearly right away. You will only be exposed for a little bit, and that's when you get to some of the tombs that are in the middle of the queue. This can greatly contrast Disneyland, where you only get a couple of umbrellas. There is also a horse-drawn hearse here as well. The hearse is black this time, and it's a different style. Unfortunately, there are no plants nearby for the ghost horse to nibble on this go-round. Something I want to point out, because I think it's a little interesting, is how the number of spokes differ from the front and rear wheel at Disneyland while they are the same at Disney World. It appears that at one point in Disneyland a rear wheel was broken, which you can see here because it's propped up on a jack stand. They then ended up replacing it with a wheel that has fewer spokes. One does not necessarily think of fun and games when it comes to a final resting place. But that is the case here at Disney World. You'll find yourself confronting several busts, and there's actually a logic murder mystery puzzle here that you can solve. There are also several tombstones that you'll find peppered around. There's a tomb that has various earthly instruments on one side, ghostly instruments on the other, and a very detailed organ on the side. With just a simple touch, you'll be playing some haunting tunes. Another tomb, one of a fellow that's found himself a watery grave, is leaking and you can try to stop the leaks by covering them up, but others will just burst out. Occasionally, he'll also start to sing and bubbles will float out from the top. There's mausoleums here, but this time it's more about the poetry and less about the irony. Many of the tombstones, and especially this mausoleum here, pay tribute to people who were involved in the attraction in some way. The next tomb that you go by has various books that'll pop in and out on their own. You can try to push some back in, but there's no way you're getting them all. Something particularly cool is that you can actually decipher a message using the symbols on the spines of some of these books. On the side of this tomb, there's a ghostly spirit working on her poetry, and you can even lend a hand. A fun feature in this queue is that there's dog prints and even a dog door. As we get closer to entering the mansion, we find a few more tombstones, but this time there's one that's a little special. This tombstone will occasionally move a little forward, open its eyes, and look around. In the foyer, there's a rather large chandelier with some candelabras on the wall. There's also a spider webbed pattern on the floor and some rather batty wallpaper. As all the guests get corralled into this octagon-shaped room, a pre-show starts. As the ghost host narrates, the portraits are fully revealed. Towards the end of the pre-show, it becomes pitch black and a grisly scene is revealed to us. As the pre-show ends, you find that there's a new doorway leading to a corridor. Upon entering this mysterious corridor, you find that a sudden storm has overtaken the mansion. 
Even more baffling than a sudden storm is how the paintings react to every flash of lightning by morphing into something disturbing. At the end of the corridor, there's a couple of busts that somehow manage to keep their eye on you. Along the walls, there's a wood paneling that has various decorative skulls on it. The chains that guide the guests are all connected by decorative bats. The room that leads up to the ride vehicle is filled with spider webs. There is also an eerie fog beyond the doom buggies. Before entering the doom buggies, you'll get to step on a moving walkway that has a decorative pattern. Now, I don't know if it's just me, but after reviewing this footage, it kind of looks like there's a hidden Mickey there. Maybe a bit of a stretch, but what do you think? In Disney World, the foyer is quite different. There's no longer candles on the chandelier, that batty wallpaper is gone, and this time there's a fireplace with a portrait hanging over it. This is definitely no ordinary portrait as it goes through a disquieting metamorphosis as it rapidly ages. This actually mimics one of the morphine portraits that was at Disneyland. Going into the stretching room, there are a few subtle but numerous differences. There is now a pattern on the floor that mimics that which is on top. There are grates with mysterious faces in them, kind of like the fireplace. The ledge that the gargoyles sit on is thicker. The wallpaper has fewer colors and has a different pattern. The part of the ceiling that meets the wall also has a different pattern. The area closest to the wall has three evenly spaced segments. The part a bit further from the wall now has two long and one short segment, rather than having seven. Also, the corners now have five sides instead of four. The reason for the corner panels being different like that is that at Disneyland the corner actually flattens out, giving it a total of 16 sides rather than 8. Once everyone is in the stretching room at Disney World, the door closes from one side. At Disneyland, the door closes from both sides and you're actually in an elevator at this point. You could tell if you're in an elevator or not due to the seam that's in the threshold between the two rooms. There are also subtle differences between the portraits, for example the leaves to the sides of this lady sitting on a gravestone. When the hanging skeleton is revealed to us, only two windows are visible except for during the strikes of lightning, which make the other two visible. At Disneyland, all four windows are visible the entire time. The sequence also seems to last a little bit longer at Disneyland. As the pre-show ends and the door opens, we see that there is similar wood paneling behind the door. At Disneyland, however, it's just black, quite possibly due to it being an elevator. The wallpaper in this corridor is the same as it was in the foyer. The familiar wood paneling and decorative bat stanchions are here again. We also have some paintings, but these ones don't change. The moving walkway has offset yellow bats instead of a decorative pattern. On the other side of the doom buggies, there is no longer a black void with some fog, but more portraits and some faces. We are going to continue on with Disney World here because it kind of has a little bit of catching up to do. And there's a couple of unique scenes as well early on. First we go under a staircase where there's a floating candelabra. We now come into a corridor where there are the changing portraits that react to the lightning like in the queue at Disneyland. However, this time we'll only find four because the decaying portraits was in the foyer. We now enter a library where we see some of those moving busts that we saw at Disneyland, but this time there are more. There are also some moving books in the bookcases. In this music room, there's a mysterious shadow that appears to be playing the piano. We also get a glimpse at the eerie weather going on outside. We begin to ascend a staircase, and then we find ourselves in a corridor with infinite stairs all around, and you even see some phantom footsteps walking on them. Transitioning to the next room, we find ourselves confronted with some haunting eyes. But maybe it's just our mind playing tricks on us, because it appears it's just the wallpaper. As we embark on our journey at Disneyland, we no longer go through this mysterious curtain threshold that seems to have this figure glaring down at us. We also pass by a familiar gargoyle that we've seen in the music room at Disney World. The column seems to be similar, but there's different spacing of the segments and the candelabra looks different as well. A fun feature of this column that we didn't notice at Disney World is that there are actually smiling faces around it. As we make it to our first show scene, we see a suit of armor that is moving, and there's also a candelabra floating in the middle of an endless hallway. 
In the next scene, we see a coffin with someone or something trying to push their way out, as there's a crow nearby cawing. When we look to the other side, we see a mysterious mirror with some pictures on either side of it. We then go down a corridor that has numerous haunting doors with various effects as we go by. We then pass by a grandfather clock with a shadowy hand that swoops by. In this show scene, there are quite a few differences. The suit of armor in this scene is holding an axe instead of a halberd. The feathers in his helmet are more numerous and there's no red, and he's unable to hold his shield as high. Also, there's no longer a plant next to him. In the endless hallway, there's now a hat rack. The wallpaper is different and is the one with the eyes. In the case of these chairs, there is more of a purple color than maroon. There are fewer tassels at the base. The cushion no longer has that decorative sine wave pattern, and the tassels on the arms aren't as long. Even the pattern on the back of the seat is a little different. Now I hear you, maybe you're thinking the one at Disneyland matches the one in the library. Well, that's actually not the case. Though the color is closer, the armrests are now rounded, there's still fewer tassels at the bottom, and in fact a bit more different, and the decorative sine wave is not there either. In the next scene where we see the guy trying to escape the coffin, we see quite a few differences here as well. The wreath that the crow is on has a black ribbon on it. There is a broken pane of glass. There are more flowers in front of the coffin. The flower pots are less decorative. The floral arrangement on top of the coffin is more at the foot of the coffin. The trees appear to be larger outside. On the other end there is now another door and that mirror and table are missing. Some of the changes in the hallways of doors includes this new vase on a stand. The pictures are in different locations and of different quantities. The exit sign is red instead of green on this particular door. There's also a green backlight on a couple of the doors and this last door even has a new effect where it is bulging from the top. Here's a portion that warranted a closer look. So we got a portrait that has what seems to be a fairly similar image of someone holding an ax, but in one he's holding a rope as the other one has a noose around his neck. Also one is in a square frame while the other is in a round one. To the right they both have three portraits next to it and both of them have a desk by them but the dressing on the desks are different. When we get to the grandfather clock, we see that the wallpaper is different, and also the hand swipes in a different direction. Back at Disneyland in the seance room, there's a mysterious floating crystal ball with the head of a woman saying incantations to summon spirits. There is a crow perched on the back of the seat, and there's various instruments and some other objects floating above. We find ourselves on a balcony overlooking the ballroom where there's a weird green eerie fire taking place. A hearse has also broken in through the door. There are ghosts floating above as well as hanging out on the chandelier. We can also see that the storm is still raging on out the windows. A crow is perched on the handrail across the room. There are several ghosts dancing. There are two paintings that are dueling. And there's an organ with spirits coming out of it as it is being played. In the attic, we find a bunch of discarded antiques, along with various portraits where the man's head mysteriously vanishes, and each one has the same bride. Now we see a shadow playing the piano at Disneyland, but this time it's more of a profile, and is on the wall instead of the floor. To the right of the last portrait with a disappearing head, we find a mysterious figure in a wedding dress who is able to conjure a hatchet out of thin air. We then come across a ghoulish figure with lots of hat boxes around him, and then his face vanishes and reappears in the hat box in his hand. The chair in the seance room is a different one, and it doesn't have that bumped up crown section that the crow is perched on. There's now some kind of green wisp thing in the back. The book now has a red bookmark in it, and the tablecloth also is different as well. In the ballroom, the ghost on the fireplace seems to be permanently visible, as in Disneyland he would disappear. The curtains over the window are a little bit more open. The figure that is under the table, his legs are more perpendicular to the table instead of at a 45-ish degree angle. There no longer seems to be a wine bottle next to them, which I suspect to be the culprit. 
There also is a less torn wallpaper on the wall, and there's no crow on the guardrail. The planter on the balcony across the way is now underneath one of the paintings instead of being closer to the staircase. There is also a missing spider. Before we enter the attic, we pass by a piece of artwork rather than furniture. The overall setup and antiques in the attic are quite different, but overall the same tone and feel is kept. There is no longer the shadow playing the piano, nor the hatbox ghost. The absolutely most intriguing difference here is how all the pictures with Constance and a former husband are the same frame, except for one, and that's the one with Frank and Constance. There's no longer those squares on the sides of the frame, and it also makes an M shape at the top. After leaving the attic, we descend down at an angle with some harrowing trees looking down on us. There's even another crow. Once we reach the ground, we see the caretaker and his dog, and they're horrified. In this graveyard, it is full of various ghosts and animals having a party. And there's so much going on, it's hard to keep up with all the little details. Providing the lyrics to all the music that is going on is five singing busts. The celebration really spread along this graveyard because even on the other end there are still several ghouls having a good time. As we pass the last group of ghosts, we find ourselves entering some form of mausoleum. Inside we see three hitchhiking ghosts. As we pass by the mirror we see that a hitchhiking ghost is following us in our dune buggy. As we find ourselves at the end of the attraction, we disembark on another moving walkway that has that same decorative pattern as it did at the start. After leaving the attic in Disney World, we find that the crow is now to the right instead of overhead. The trees also seem to be less menacing. The groundskeeper has a completely different hat as well as lantern. Even his scarf is different and it's even draped over the other shoulder. The dog seems like it may be a different breed as it has more hair and its ears seem to be shorter as well. The three ghosts on the right in this band have been switched around. The ghost swinging on the tree in the back has a taller hat and the swing is attached to a single branch instead of two different ones. The singing busts seem to be quite identical and I can't really find any particular features that are different. Here we see the tablecloth as well as the picnic basket underneath have this blue picnic pattern to them. There also no longer is a bottle of wine chilling next to it, and the candles on the table are now lit. The hand sticking out of the crypt is holding onto a teacup instead of a martini glass, and it is no longer wearing any jewelry. It seems like the Disney World Haunted Mansion is bone dry when it comes to alcohol. The crypt with the pulsing bricks is now after this party instead of before it. The ghost next to the mummy is now using his cane rather than holding it to the side. The ghost that is within a crypt now has two arms and glowing eyes holding up a hidden Mickey. Here the ghost to the right of the singing lady is holding up her hair instead of it being around his neck. The mausoleum that we enter is also different. The hitchhiking ghosts here have a lot more baggage. The mirrors in Disneyland are hanging by a rope that is mounted near the ceiling. This time as you see the ghosts in the mirror, they'll interact with your image as they are animated. As we get deeper in the mausoleum, now we see a tiny figure of a woman in a wedding dress telling us to hurry back and bring our death certificates. As the ride wraps up, a phantom arrow shows us the direction to leave as we step back onto a batty walkway. Before we exit the ride at Disneyland, first we walk through the mausoleum a little bit, and then we have to take a moving walkway up a level. Here is where we see the little figure in the wedding dress who is dying to see us again. When we disembark our dune buggies at Disney World, we're already outside the mausoleum, so we just have to walk down a little corridor. As we make our way outside, we find that there are even more tombs. Here there's some more punny names that are dead on arrival. And we also have one with Bluebeard and his loving wives. Well, six of them. Further down the path we find the pet cemetery, which I think it was definitely wiser to put it a little bit further from the house. Thank you for watching and don't forget to subscribe so that you will know when part two is out. This report was on the Haunted Mansion because of the high number of requests, so if you have a future attraction you would like to see, please leave it in the comments.